gentlemen. Uh, we're we're going to kick off. We realize there are going to be a few people uh, trickling in, but we're going to uh, get started. Um, I'm Tom Lerner. I'm senior scientist and uh, head of modern and contemporary art research at the Getty Conservation Institute, the GCI. I'm very pleased to welcome you all here tonight um, to our panel discussion, which is entitled Ethical Dilemmas in the Conservation of Modern and Contemporary Art. Uh, which is part of our ongoing um, Conservation Matters, um, a series of, of public lectures that the GCI uh, or organises. One of the main aims of the GCI uh, is to respond to existing and emerging needs of the conservation profession in all areas of cultural heritage. And one such area that is giving rise to a great many needs and concerns is modern and contemporary art. Many of these works were either intentionally meant not to last, or were made from new and untested materials that have turned out to be dramatically unstable or likely to become obsolete as technology advances. These objects raise difficult ethical questions about their conservation, such as, should the preservation of such works focus on the original materials or place emphasis on the original appearance? Should we attempt to prolong the life of ephemeral pieces if the artist's intention is subsequently compromised? And should a work that deteriorates beyond a certain point be replaced or remade, or should the work be declared dead? As the art profession struggles with these and other difficult issues, it has become apparent that the subject is also arousing much public and journalistic intrigue, admittedly not always positive. And as part of the GCI's thinking on how best to approach this aspect, we thought it would make an excellent topic on which to base a public panel discussion. Um, two very short notices before I introduce tonight's panel. Um, there will be a reception in the entrance hall behind you uh, immediately after the uh, panel, and you're all invited to that. Um, and if you want to try and corner the speakers, uh, ask questions, please do try it, although I can tell you they will normally get mobbed. Um, so best to try and get your, your, sharp your elbows and get in there quickly. Um, and second, please, I heard one already, um, please turn your cell phones off or to silence them at, 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 at least. There's another one. <laughs> it is now my um, great pleasure to introduce this evening's um, distinguished panelists from three of the most renowned and respected museums of modern and contemporary art. From your right, um, Susan Lake is Director of Collection Management and Chief Conservator at the Herschel Museum and Sculpture Garden in Washington, DC, where she has worked for more than 25 years. She holds a PhD in conservation research and has written on the techniques of William de Kooning, Frank Stella, Jackson Pollock, and Paul Tech. Matthew Gale is head of displays at Tate Modern in London. As one of the curators intimately concerned with Tate's collection, he worked closely with their conservation department in developing Tate's research project on the replication of modern sculptures that are subject to unforeseen degradation. This culminated in the cross-disciplinary workshop Inherent Vice, the replica, and its implications in modern sculpture held at Tate Modern in October 2007. Jill Sterrett is Director of Collections and Conservation at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. She joined the museum in 1990 as a conservator for works on paper and photographs. Prior to her SF MoMA appointment, Sterrett served in the conservation departments of a number of distinguished institutions, including the Library of Congress, the National Library of Australia, Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Fine Arts Museum of San Francisco. And finally, our moderator this evening, who many of you will uh, know and recognize, is Edward Goldman, the host of KCRW's Art Talk. He immigrated to the US from the former Soviet Union, where he worked as an art educator for the Hermitage Museum in St. Petersburg. He came to Los Angeles 30 years ago and quickly joined the arts community as a teacher at Art Center College of Design, as a curator of exhibitions, and as a writer for various catalogues and publications. In addition to these academic pursuits, Goldman established a career as an art advisor for major American corporations and private collectors. Please join me in welcoming this evening's panelists. So I guess I have to start because I have the special mic. And uh, I want to tell everyone who's sitting in the last cell rows all these reserved seats reserved for you, for people who are supposed to be calling the saying, I am listening to our talk. So seriously, if you feel more comfortable, we have here two dozen of seats. And it's nice to see people closer. So 
make us feel more home. Um, I was asked to moderate this panel discussion probably because I'm not involved professionally in restoration. I have no responsibility to maintenance of artworks. And when we come to the museums and we enjoy great exhibitions and great permanent collections, we very rarely aware that it's only tip of the iceberg. What museums do behind the closed doors to make these works look its best and to last as long as possible. I don't think that any conservator ever have a guts to say, what do you think the physical possibility of this particular object, artworks, classical artwork from Greek and Roman antiquities, or it's <coughs> Renaissance painting, or it's 20th century art. Do you think this artwork has some kind of physical age after which it's not disintegrated, just falls apart? I remember my uh, professor, curator of the Roman collection at the Hermitage, told me, I thought that it doesn't happen, but now I learned happens, that some kind of chemical process which happens within the ancient Roman vase, glass vase. You might remember if you've seen them, they don't have sometimes complete translucency. They have this kind of strange iridescent quality. It means that there is some kind of cancerous development going on, and one day infrastructure crumbles and curator comes to see at the museum vitrine this beautiful vase, and instead of vase, it's only a small heap of the glass ash. So that made me aware that artworks, no matter how well and how long we're taking care of, have physical limitation of how long they can be in front of our eyes. Let me read something that I found in the Wall Street Journal, and if it's in the Wall Street Journal, it's supposed to be true. <laughs> it's an article on January 21st, 2009, by Daniel Grant. He starts with, Art's long and vita brevis, art, art is long and life is short, according to the ancient Roman saying, but sometimes art doesn't hold up its end of the bargain. The canvas warps, he talks about most contemporary art, the canvas warps, the metal bands, the paper turns brown. New artworks may look like old works in a short period of time, leaving their buyers feeling as though they have been had. But it's not fully clear what responsibility artists bear to their complete work, especially after it has been sold. That's particularly the case for artists who purposefully use ephemeral materials in their art, bee pollen, banana peels, lard, elephant dung, and you know that I'm not exaggerating. <laughs> Leaves, mud, moss, and newspaper clippings, to name a few examples. Isn't it the buyer's responsibility to know what they're getting? Now, I want you to think about conundrum, not only for the buyers, private collectors, but for the museum that either buy it or get it as the gift. So, it's not what article says, it's what I'm suggesting for panelists. Not only buyer beware, but museum beware as well. What your response would be? Uh, most museums, um, especially modern contemporary, have a vetting process in which the curators and conservators weigh in. We even have it online within the museum, and so um, we discuss those possibilities, and um, those are taken into account. And works are not acquired for that reason, or in some cases they are. So can you, can you think about any work that your museum, Hirschhorn Museum, could acquire or could get as a gift, but was declined, talking about very 
appealing work of art, very serious work of art, or very well-known artist, but museum declined to take it because it would be beyond museum control to retain the piece as it is because it would be deteriorating in front of your eyes. We, during, um, in preparation for the last board meeting, um, we did not acquire a proposed work. Now, it was uh, an up-and-coming artist, and the museum probably will acquire a work by this artist in the future, but this work was just too ephemeral. It was falling apart before our But what it was made of? Styrofoam. 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 Maybe just as a, a counterpoint, um, you made me think about the challenges that we face with contemporary art, and, and they were challenges that were rooted with in um, materials and what we know about the aging of materials. And indeed, the field of preservation has inherited most of our techniques because we study materials and we actually then try to extend the life of materials. And where this becomes very prickly with contemporary art is that there are other criteria that you have to use in order to, um, in order to evaluate your, your approach um, to conservation. And as I might respond to your question um, about works um, that are acquired, I can tell you that we have a wonderful work by the artist Anna Mendieta in the collection. It was um, Talis Mater, and it's a a work made of ficus roots that are glued together with Elmer's glue. And by all conventional standards, that's a work that one might say you don't acquire. It's going to be too difficult to care for. Its life is not going to, you know, it's not going to be long enough. And in fact, what happened is that it was precisely that argument that its life was, was in peril that made our museum acquire it because its memory, its place in art history and its place in our culture was already to be really so important that we decided that really we should make it the business of our museum to bring a work like this in. And if not um, our museum, then where might the research go into caring for something that we want to keep? So. And if I can add, uh, there was an Anna, Anna Mendieta retrospective or show recently and we wanted to include this piece in um, that show, and we asked for it, and SF MoMA made a very compelling argument that it should not travel. We did in the end, though. It made it to your tour. It did? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot. None of this has been rehearsed, I should just say. <laughs> So, Matthew, do you want to step in? I mean, I, I think both of those examples illustrate that, that um, you know, what you're saying, the museum beware, the museum is mm -hmm. uh, being aware, um, is part of a, a public institution's responsibility to, to weigh up those, those questions, and the decision may be completely different, as those two mm -hmm. examples show, but what's important is going in with your eyes open and, and understanding what the problems mm -hmm. might be. And that uh, level of analysis has become more mm -hmm. sophisticated uh, over, year, uh, over recent years, just as the challenges have become more complex. So let me uh, throw one of the many uh, bombs which I'm planning. Um, <laughs> Daniel Horst. I thought everyone knows this name, and everyone probably heard or read about his famous uh, shark. I never remember the complete title of the piece, but physical impossibility, thinking about death, yes. How many people have had a chance to see it, either in London or right now it's in the Metropolitan Museum? and probably everyone at least once read about that more than once. So for me, when I saw it for the first time at, uh, in London, five, six years ago, I was impressed, though I was not prepared to be impressed. And skeptical as I am, being critic, critic I was spending quite a time walking around and 
and it was murky formaldehyde in which it's because was not clear any longer, not completely translucent, and Sharp was definitely looking like it's ready to retire. <laughs> <laughs> but it was menacing indeed. It was still just suspended in half of this tank. A year later, I found out that Daniel Hurst uh, bought it back from the gallery that bought it, and he sold it to, I don't remember the name of American uh, millionaire collector, who been debating and discussing with the artists, not with the conservators, but with the artists initially, what to do, I guess, smartly enough, he asked artists, because artists still alive, definitely, what to do. And I remember going on the air and saying, for heaven's sake, if they would buy me a coffee, I would save them hundreds of thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. Don't restore poor shark, just throw it out, buy the new shark. After all, it's not the shark either cut by artist himself, he just bought it. Definitely not made by the artist, it just put there by the artist. <laughs> and do you really want to restore formaldehyde, original, authentic formaldehyde, which, what does it mean authentic formaldehyde? Throw it out, clean it. I can come to help you to clean uh, this fish tank <laughs> and put it back with the artist's blessing. And you know what? A year later, after many, many debates and consultation, that's exactly what they've done. Did they ask me thank you? Did they <laughs> so you mean you restored his show? <laughs> I gave an idea. I gave my just million dollars advice for nothing. <laughs> but my best advice, advice which I force on people, yes, when they don't ask me. But seriously, uh, do you remember your first response to this news? And what was this response was? Matthew, I'm asking you. I think um, Hearst has, a, has faced up to an issue with a, actually rather bravely, He's looked at the at the work, seen that it required some radical gesture to resolve it, and has set in place a, a means of doing that. Um, it makes a considerable difference that he is alive and able to do that and make those judgments on that particular piece. I think if we were talking about an artist who was no longer with us, we would have a very complicated set of problems to face. But the, uh, there is a clear distinction between the sorts of problems that arise from a contemporary work of art that is uh, made by an artist who's still alive, who uh, one can approach, who is legally bound to have a say in what happens to their work, uh, and the work of art by an artist who is no longer with us. And, that, and, and so you have a different body of people to enter into the debate. And I think that's quite a, a, a clear and important distinction to make. And we had previous conversation the uh, last couple of hours. And uh, remind me, who is the artist who said that he doesn't want his work? He wants his work to die, literally, to cease to exist after 20 years. Well, we had a. a a, a short clip of Gary Hill raising that as a possibility. Mm -hmm. A video artist, one of the best video artists, Gary Hill. And but I think uh, we, were, we were also discussing this, and I think that actually what Gary Hill's saying there echoes what Marcel Duchamp had said in the 1960s, that a work of art should have a, a, a distinct lifespan and conceptually could be set aside. Do we want to play that? We might. Should we? It's just only a minute and a half. Clip in the Gary Hill. Is that one or two? Number one. But meanwhile, I just want, as a food for thought, to suggest that so many wonderful works of 
uh, art create by, created by video artists in 60s and 70s and 80s. Technologically, they're obsolete. The images definitely have staying power from the day one until we care to look at them. But the TV monitors that Nanjing Park were using in 1960s, you know, you cannot even restore them. Some of them still functioning. So his work, if all this machinery will be removed and we will put contemporary flat screens, mimicking the same action, does it change his work? Does it change his intentions? Is his intentions images? Or his intentions to give you authentic communication with this obsolete machine? I have certainly some works that are, are going to be difficult to, to conserve. I guess the main thing is the student issue, really. And I have some works that they really would not work any other way. And um, I think it would be better to make the tubes. <laughs> They're not only sculptural, they, they produce a completely different kind of light. It's much brighter, at least now. So that's what I mean, this, is always, this conversation is always in flux. Imagine when people, you know, when painters made it uh, 200 years ago. Or imagine that a, a painting that is seen in this light as opposed to this light. I mean, isn't that a greater difference than maybe even then if something was on a display, uh, a, a, a LCD or plasma or, or CRT? I mean, I think people also have a tremendous ability to filter in the sense of like, what is something supposed to be? If there's enough contextualization of something, I'm not talking about, you know, like over years, if even the work deserves to be conserved, for how long? Why? I mean, if it has no, uh, if it's served its function, <laughs> uh, it may be time for it to, you know, be let go. You know, there could be um, ritual moments or something, ritual deaths of art, perhaps, like museums could hold. Or, you know, there would be, in other words, it would be a conscious thing and people would see that. Instead of storing this or what have you, maybe. To this, I want to add another quote from this article in Wall Street Journal. The quote is A question arises of when or if to call in the artist if physical problem arises with the artwork. Tom Lerner, a conservator at the Getty Conservation Institute in Los Angeles, Lynn Stott, contacting the original artist, which is totally logical. But now I'm adding to myself, but what if 20 or 30 years later, is not, uh, the artist is not in his prime time, or simply doesn't have the original materials he had used decades earlier? I don't think that the purpose of these debates is to come to the resolution or solution to all these issues, but just to share with you unbelievable complexities that curators or can, uh, curators, curators, yes, and restorers dealing with the contemporary art, dealing with that, you think that uh, works painted by Dutch masters in the 17th century or Italian artists in the Renaissance, works which are three or 500 years old, should create much more headache for, restore, for restorers, conservators, than works done 10, 15 years ago but surprisingly and ironically, no. Because for hundreds of years, artists were trained not to only be respect and understand craft and longevity of their product was something assumed by everyone, by their clients, by their artists, by anyone who can encounter with this artwork. So think about that, that unless uh, the damage was done to Rembrandt paintings, it hangs on the walls of the National Gallery in Washington, or the Armitage, or the Museum of the Louvre, and doesn't require, yes, it has to be 
monitored, they have to be in the climate <coughs> control, they have to be varnishes getting yellowed and have to be removed and put another one. But it may be lasting another 100 to 200 years if we are taking good care of it. But I mean that if we take extremely good care of some of the contemporary artworks, extremely good care, they still are going to deteriorate beyond control. Am I right about that? Sure, I think um, to follow up both on what Edward's saying, and I think that for me the key moments in Gary Hill's clip are that he's really posing some of the challenges that I think we have to confront with contemporary art. And, and what that means is, is that the methods that we've used for more traditional art forms may actually let us down. Um, that there are questions and there are evolving approaches um, which allow us to get at what constitutes the life and death of the work, what constitutes, you know, sort of the, um, the um, heart of a piece, what is the concept that needs to be preserved, is the concept more important or equal to um, the materials from which a work is made? And all of these questions are at play uh, when you are considering approach an approach mm -hmm. to uh, contemporary art. And I think it allows us, um, I can't help but I see Nancy Troy in the audience and she sort of gave us a phrase which is this interpretive gap. Um, when you are, when you are um, confronted with objects, you can actually interrogate their physical presence and you can actually study, um, you know, archival knowledge of the, of the maker or of the work in its own time. But inevitably, you, there's a moment when you install a work and you have to bridge an interpretive gap. Um, you have to decide what your message is with an artwork. And contemporary art often puts us right into the interpretive gap. Do we have now GABA to put? So who wants to talk about this piece? Who has the most direct, intimate knowledge of this piece? Um, well, I do. Uh, this is, uh, as you can see, it's the uh, set design for La Chatte, which Gabo and Pevsa made for Diagonus Ballet. It was made um, ready to celebrate 20 years of Ballet Russe as the most radical ballet of its period, and therefore it was deliberately a very radical enterprise made of shaped plastics the dancers wore, um, plastic helmets, plastic tutus. Um, which is quite difficult to dance in, it turned out. Um, the Tate has a major collection of, of Gabba's work, and particularly of the, of the plastics from the 20s, has the uh, elements of the model that Gabba made to convince Jagalov of this work. And uh, it is in, inherent in the material that he used, which he thought was modern and had a seemingly endless life, that it will disintegrate. So this was a problem that uh, Tom alluded to the workshop that we held at the Tate. This was a problem that we felt we needed to confront, that how to deal with uh, a work of art <coughs> in which the material is disintegrating in a way that the artist had not foreseen. Um, and what we've got in the next image, I think, uh, oh, is a related piece, another of Gabo's plastic piece, and we started to undertake a project to establish how one could start to measure and recuperate these works. Key to all of this is documentation, trying to, uh, first of all, establish uh, archival imagery, but also um, what the form and uh, quality of the material was when we acquired it, and then up to the moment. Um, at the top you can see, uh, actually if I can see it properly, this is uh, actually starting to make a virtual reconstruction of one of the related pieces also from the 1920s called Circular Relief. And 
what we were hoping to do here, and is part of a longer project, is to at least build up an archive of material so that um, we can log the qualities of the artwork even if the thing continues to disintegrate. And one of the questions that that has raised, of course, is whether if that disintegration becomes irreversible and extreme, do you then draw from that to make a replica? So a broader question arises from that. Um, disintegrating artwork, does a replica follow? What does making a replica of an artwork lead to? And a whole array of questions arise from that. We've got, a, um, we've got this. <laughs> you can see that the, uh, the sort of dish that forms the major part of this has a great curvature in it, a warp in it, which magically gets resolved in this virtual reconstruction. It's quite a uh, nifty bit of work here. But um, actually what seems quite a straightforward bit of computer animation takes a uh, considerable amount of resource and time to uh, establish, not least because it's used laser scanning, or well, laser scans don't show up uh, in uh, transparent objects, so certain new techniques had to be developed to uh, bring this into uh, an effective, accurate way of measuring an artwork. Matthew, and I understand that uh, original, originally it was made from totally translucent plastic. Transparent. Transparent. And now? It's transparent, but is it well, what happens as clear as it used to be? What Probably with not. The, with these sorts of plastics, is that not only do they discolor, but they then craze, and um, then gradually the basically the chemical structure mm -hmm. disintegrates. This, so the question is, if are we there absolute? Following to the to the maximum truthfulness, uh, peace will be replicated. Should we continue to show in a museum sad corpse of the artwork, <laughs> <laughs> but its authentic corpse of the former saint, or you want to? Recreate the saint. This is a work in the Hirshhorn collection by Pevsner, who worked with Gabo. It's 1923, and the <coughs> image on your left is from 1974, and the one on the right is, uh, I think, 2005. It's actually in much worse condition right now, and obviously we cannot show it. Um, but it gives you an idea of, of the, the, the line of progression. But something I, I just wanted to, to comment on is the artist's use of materials. Yes, there isn't um, maybe the um, instruction, etc. but sometimes artists use these materials very deliberately. They have cultural connotations that are very significant, and that certainly is the case here. Um, I remember when, about 15 years ago, around this time, uh, Anthony Kiefer had a fantastic exhibition at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Mocha, in downtown. And uh, museum curators told me, semi-jokingly, semi-seriously, that probably these artists will make the new generation of the conservatives very rich people because his works, and he's one of the most right now probably respected and recognized artists on the contemporary art scene, but his works takes tremendous amount of attention by museums, by museum curators, museum uh, uh, conservation department, because maybe you might remember some of the works, just you see semi-treated, if treated at all, hay literally attached to the service of the canvases. And every day, guards just go and a little bit just dust this precious subject and after 
favorite way. So what do you do with this hay? Do you remove from this from time to time with his permission and apply? What do you do with a crease of Philly uh, elephant dung if it start deteriorate? Probably it will. It should. <laughs> Otherwise it wouldn't be dung. Sure it would be called something else. It would be called gold. I don't think it does. I don't think it does disintegrate. It's yes, Matthew, with all it's respect, it's only 15 years old now. <laughs> but being archaeologists, the way I was trained, I just sometimes look at the objects which are 2,000 years old or 200 years old. And here we want to talk about how many materials are in chemical solutions and new things and tools that you as a curators and conservators have in your hands. But restoring some of the precious objects of contemporary and modern art, how do we know if the tools that we are using are not going to harm these works after all? No one can say what there will be long-lasting effect with some kind of chemical solution we are using today because we have only 10, 15, 20 years of knowledge of them. Some conservators in the old-fashioned museum like Hermitage still using for restoration of the Rembrandts and Leonardo and Raphael only glue made out of precious glue and every year they can produce not more than a few kilograms uh, glue made out of the bones of the sturgeon fish, which almost extinct. And they do it in a terribly, hilariously old-fashioned way, but the justification is we've been doing it for the last 200 years, and still there is no reverse effect. So we would rather uh, err on the caution side than just use something unbelievable, new, fantastic material. What do you have to say to that? Well, our kefir is actually quite easy. It's one of the least of the problematic of the works that we have. You have them in your collection as well. I kefir is a great example because um, in many cases, I don't know if, yeah, here's, this is a work from our collection which by, um, at a quick glance, you can liken it to a painting. And in fact, it has a lot of the qualities of a two-dimensional painting surface. There's a canvas, there's a stretcher, there's definitely paint, there's other mixed media, but there's some porcelain attachments to it as well. What's interesting is that while you call it a painting, the work is actually rooted in all kinds of other art forms as well. Um, and, and in fact, I think we approach the care of this work um, like we might other forms of contemporary art. And we accept a tolerance for change because it's part of the artist's intention. Um, so while there's this kind of fastidious attention to um, the surface of the paint and to making sure that the canvas is sound, um, we also understand that there is a tolerance for change and loss in this piece and that it needn't be the cause of great alarm. And I think that's where my um, feelings with Susan might align. I think that Kiefer lined up against many other works in our collection is not our biggest worry. Not our biggest worry. I was, in preparing for this panel, I was pulling up some um, old articles and I found a 1986 Time magazine review which included a, a comment about this very piece. And it, in the article it said that it, we couldn't really expect these works to last. 50 or 25 years, and I realized, well, we're at the 25-year mark just about now, and, mm -hmm. and in fact, it's, it's okay, so. By the way, I also want to remind you that uh, contemporary artists shouldn't be blamed for experimenting and doing things in the new way. After all, at the time when Leonardo da Vinci was still alive, his famous Last Supper started to deteriorate because he pushed the envelope and he used not proper materials experimenting with them. So uh, it's a na nature of the artistic process, trying to do something new and pushing yourself and to be involved and trying to do something. 
But here, another quote from this article, back to Wall Street Journal. Artists experimenting with materials in one is one of the reasons contemporary art may not hold up even in the short run. Another is that the training of artists nowadays rarely includes educating them about the properties of the materials they use. So it's one thing that very poor artist buying household paint instead of good expensive uh, painting and tubes. But we are talking about this, some artists really don't have this kind of sense of obligation to longevity. Whatever they might say in conceptual terms, in conceptual artists, let's put them aside. A person who makes a painting and who is using materials which start to deteriorate a few years later, I have kind of problem with the ultimately respecting him as the artist, not as a thinker, not as a pushing envelope, but and there's something uh, upsetting about that. It makes now, I'm saying for myself, make me think about the good old days when tradition required the architect who built the bridge to stand underneath the structure on opening day as heavy trucks drove over it. <laughs> Architects literally put their lives on the line. I wonder if that rule shouldn't be applied in the art world. If we could see the next um, image. This is an artist who uses oil paint, very traditional. And um, these works by Ad Reinhardt are some of, I think, inarguably the most difficult works to deal with, but it's traditional materials. It's, they're incredibly unforgiving. Um, there are very few Ad Reinhardt um, original paintings in existence, and this is one in the Hirshhorn, and we're afraid to show it because you can't touch it without the surface, the suede-like surface. It's hard, if those of you have seen them, they're, they're divided into the nine squares of very subtle, almost suede-like, different um, degrees of, of black. Most of them have been repainted. And in fact, during his lifetime, Reinhardt requested that his own works would, become, would come back to the studio and he would repaint them. But only he, um, uh, their, their statements in the um, Archives of American Art, he felt only he could paint it. Uh, and if, it was, if he didn't do it, it wasn't a Reinhardt. This, um, there was a show in the um, Guggenheim Museum recently, an installation about the ethical dilemmas in treating works like this. Because once they examined the work that um, had become the sacrificial lamb for this inst for this um, installation, they discovered it had nine or oh, it's eleven layers of overpaint. It had been repainted eleven times, and not by and not by the artist. So. And if you could sh just see the next image, I think a lot of us can, if we're honest with ourselves, acknowledge that these uh, monochromatic paintings of the 60s and 70s, not contemporary works, um, are extremely difficult to work with. And we'll talk about this in a minute, but the, the, um, the field has changed. It's no longer if it ever was, acceptable to completely repaint a work. But many of these works were repainted. And this is an example in the Hirshhorn collection, not to, to air our uh, dirty laundry, but it is repainted. Um, we don't show it now as a, as a result. Repainted with the participation of the artist himself. Correct. Because there are some occasions when artists still alive and willing to restore his or her work. Reinhardt Some regularly repaired, yeah. repaired his own works. Mm -hmm. And technically speaking, in that situation, does museum obliged to make a change in the label and to say that 1956, 1978, when it was repainted by the artist himself, and repainted by the artist or repainted by someone else? Very often, yes. Yes. There mm -hmm. may be circumstances in which the artist insists that mm -hmm. actually they haven't changed in mm -hmm. that 20-year period. Mm -hmm. That would raise a very, shall we say, lively debate mm -hmm. in the institution mm -hmm. dealing with it. But 
by and large, uh, that's what those double takes mean. But it's interesting how we are applying uh, the notion of authenticity and artistic value. But I can help myself that it has something to do with the unbelievable development of the market for contemporary and modern art in the last 20, 30 years. Astronomical prices, I don't need to insult your intelligence, we all read it in newspapers and here on the radio or on TV. So, when curators and restorers have to deal with the work which now it belongs to museum, but monetary value of this piece by contemporary artists, a couple of million dollars. And they have another work of art that have to take care of that, which only maybe 20 or 30 thousand dollars, and maybe even less. Do the curators and restorers apply different? What's their philosophy? How they treat it? Do they treat it equally or differently? I, I can see that from your face that that's a controversial <laughs> question. <laughs> I, I, from, to my mind, I don't see the controversy, but um, no, more seriously, not being, not being a conservator, I can say that conservators are amongst the most egalitarian people that I know. They, the, the approach to the object is uh, to do with the accumulation of knowledge about that object and the material itself. And one of the things about dealing with a collection, a public collection, is that on entry into the collection, the work n no longer carries that sense of its value to a more or less a degree. There will always be extremes. Um, presumably, our colleagues at the Louvre pause before cleaning the Mona Lisa. But, and it was um, not clean, the old lady was not clean for decades. <laughs> and French just don't have courage to touch it and should be touched. But I still think that, that, that by and large, the, uh, the, the treatment of a work of art is responsive to the work itself, mm -hmm. irrespective of its value. Mm -hmm. I'm very glad to hear that. But by the way, talking about money value and artworks, I wonder what we uh, talked about our ago at the beginning about uh, Shark or Dan Hurst. It was restored, and I thought in a restored, recreated, in a smart, logical way. But it belongs to private collector. Do you think if it would be in your hands, you would authorize the same way of what you would do if this shark would be in the collection of Tate Modern. Um, and, would, and if you even choose to do that, would it be easy for you to... I chosen yet. <laughs> Sorry, would it be... Easy to persuade your colleagues and trustees to go with this. I think the distinction that I made earlier on between the living artist and, mm -hmm. a, and a, an artist who's no longer with us is, is key there. Um, in the case of Hearst's practice at the present, mm -hmm. he has countenanced that replacement. Mm -hmm. We would, as any other collector would, apply directly to the artist when this mm -hmm. problem occurred. and. I think we would follow those same uh, procedures. Um, I wouldn't want to second guess that, but that would be my assumption. Mm -hmm. Now, if we're if 50 years on, we're talking. Um, luckily, I'll have retired by then. But there will it will raise completely different sets of, mm -hmm. sets of questions. But I think what's sensible about what what Hearst has done is that he has set up the mechanism mm -hmm. for dealing with something that is inevitable. That's what makes it so distinct from the situation with Gavin mm -hmm. and Pevsner, 
that they believed that this thing was going to last forever. They were in, in fact, the position that you were describing earlier of, of an artist who belongs, uh, who, who believes in the longevity of art. Um, and it makes me wonder in a broader sense about whether actually these shifts in the making of the artwork reflect shifts in our society, that there's a shift from that belief that you are making something for the gods and for uh, posterity to something that is much more responsive to the uh, living in the instant. And um, the Flavin that you see right now, Hearst has actually compared himself, um, he, he the replacement of the shark, to the changing out of the fluorescent tubes. The Flavin, he's actually used that analogy himself. He says, what's the difference? And I believe I read, and correct me if I'm wrong, that he kind of switched in the first decade or two of his career. He was absolutely like a desical. He would instruct anyone who would buy his works, and not a lot of people initially were buying his works, definitely not major museum or major collectors, just if one of the tubes start function, just throw it to the garbage, go to the store, buy another one, because it's not authenticity of material, it's the light that fills the room, just in the direction of the light. So whether it's produced with this tube or not, definitely don't want to substitute pink tube light for the yellow, but, and he, I believe, changed to the end of his life when his works became recognized and entered major museums and collectors who own these works, which price-wise go up to a million in major installation, more than a million dollars. They're so aware of monetary value on the market when it's still in their hands that if they have guests to a special party, they plug this beautiful piece by David Flavin for several minutes and unplug because they know that if the tube will die, they're losing several hundred thousand dollars and you don't want to do that <laughs> to your pocket and to your kids. So it's another kind of dilemma, which has probably nothing to do with the restoration of the artworks, but what do you do if it's in your hands? And sometimes you cannot go any longer to the factory because factory which produced these tubes doesn't exist, and technologically everything changed. So, well, do you have any works of the flower in your museum? Yes, I do, do. And I Jill, think there's, okay. a, there's this notion of ubiquity, that this idea that it was an everyday material, um, and then there's this quality of light. There's, there's not only the quality of light, but there's this, this quality of fluorescent light. And what happens as fluorescent tubes become less available, and indeed there's probably a day coming up before long when they won't be available, is that we're charged with weighing probably many qualities that make a, a damn flavin, but we're definitely weighing those two qualities in balance. Are we, are we valuing the fact that there's a ubiquitous material that the artist chose, and it really should be available to, to everybody, or is there something very, very specific about fluorescent blue emitted light from a five foot, you know, tube. And these are the questions, it seems to me, that we ask ourselves right now. And what happens is, is that we, I, I want to sort of circle back to artists that are alive. Artists do change their mind. And in fact, they are unresolved about these issues, as Gary Hill reminded us in that clip. And so if one of the things that we're charged with doing right now is asking those questions and actually being present to hear a number of people in the room, including the artists, think and change their minds, we're actually creating a body of knowledge. I would say it's a new form of documentation that is, is something we take very, very uh, seriously in the work of a contemporary art museum. How we resolve the Dan Flavin tubes right now um, one can make a custom tube. In fact, the estate has actually contracted <coughs> with a company to make a custom tube. That's, it's still possible to buy a tube. You've somehow devalued that quality of ubiquity when you do that, though. Um, and it's important to know that. Um, when the tube is no longer available, we want to be able to compile know the knowledge for us, you know, 
people who enjoy art to be able to make those decisions at the time. Um, we still, uh, I don't know if ours is up there, this is the uh, Hirshhorns. We still have the, um, the privilege of saying that we have an original tube. We have an, the original ballast and we have the original tubes. And, but you know, that's not, that's very, that's very, very sort of, a, that's a good feeling for just a very short period of time, in, you know, in the, in, in the grand scheme of things. And so it begs these questions about how we describe this quality of an artwork. So if you stay with Dan Flag, because I find it particularly interesting and telling uh, situation, if I would be a director of museum or curator of museum, or, and I would say, you know what? I want to hold on original Dan Flavin, and as long as his estate allow us for exhibition purpose to create version. So if I, as a keeper of all this precious, very important artwork, ask, to loan this piece to travel an exhibition. I don't want to loan this piece. I want to loan their specially executed work, and that's how it was done with traveling exhibition on Dan Fleming that we enjoyed a couple of years ago at LACMA, probably you remember many of you. Many of the works were recreations. So, what your position would be, would you, rather hold on the actual Dan Flavin, but you wouldn't like to these tubes to die during this year or two traveling exhibition. And I want to, each of you <laughs> to, to step out and to say, to respond to that. Well, I think is, conservators of contemporary art find themselves in a, in a conflicting position. We, of course, um, are trained to, to uh, make things and, um, to last as long as possible. But when that runs counter to the wishes of the artist, when the artist was using ubiquitous material, you find yourself in an um, inevitable position of conflict. How would you resolve this conflict? Dan Flavin didn't make any conditions that have to be unplugged and plug it only for a few minutes. Well, as a conservator, I would prefer it not to travel and we have the original ballast and the, mm -hmm. the tubes and have it be uh, recreated. But in your museum, if you would put it on permanent display, part of permanent collection, would you keep it in perpetuity or you would take it off display after a few months? The way m most of the curators in all museums, keep works on paper or photography not more than two, uh, two months in every few years? That's an interesting question. It's a, it's a bit unresolved still. Um, say the, um, the non-June Pike uh, monitors, there's still debate going on as to whether it's better to show those monitors just three months out of the year as we would a work of art on paper, or whether it's better to um, show them almost indefinitely. And even the experts that, um, cannot tell us right now. Gacy yes, definitely an expert, and the decision I think was absolutely right. Uh, a year ago was a huge and absolutely groundbreaking exhibition of the videos, uh, which uh, Getty Museum got from the Long Beach Museum of Art, which not able not longer been able to take care of these videos. There were hundreds, if not thousands of them, and technology changed, and all technology became obsolete. And Getty, I thought, did a very courageous and maybe questionable decision to substitute whatever exists inside of the screen, all the technology, for contemporary. And we still in the museum saw it physically on our side, just being an audience. We've seen it the way probably we would see it 20 or 30 years ago. But technology hiding behind the screen was totally different. So it's still a very debatable issue among the professionals, am I right? Mm -hmm. I, it's, it's, it's a very, very, um, 
I'm realizing that I'm having a hard time articulating um, some trouble I'm having with the conversation. And I think it's because we're conflating with lots of different artworks, lots of different issues. And in some cases, the materials and their authenticity is absolutely integral to what the work is. And in other cases, when we work with artists, there is a mechanism for migration. There is, in fact, it could be viewed as completely wrong-headed to not allow that mechanism for migration to happen. And what- Can you, can you, I don't understand exactly what you mean. The mechanism, mechanism for, for migration. migration. Can you um, put in different words? Sure, most time-based works are prepared to be migrated to new formats. I mean, a, Mar a wonderful um, artist working in New York, Mary Lucier, made a beautiful video in the 70s called Dawnburn, and she made it on the first Sony Portapak that ever existed as sort of a commercial video camera. And that piece exists in a fifth or sixth generation of migration right now. Because if we were going to adhere to running a Sony porta pack mm -hmm. that piece would no longer be in existence. So it has not only been migrated from Sony porta pack but it now gets shown on DVD. Do you know? Mm -hmm. And we take great pains to think about the qualities of that work as it existed in the 70s and to make sure that, or to try, to make sure that we don't abandon mm -hmm. the features from its 70, 70s creation mm -hmm. by virtue of its 2009 technology, if you will. And, and those are the, um, the, the aspects of change that we are actively involved with. And I think it goes back to this idea that if preservation is about forestalling change, which in truth it is often viewed that way, is that, and that those people, the conservators, are the ones who are trying to stop change from happening at, at all. <laughs> um, it's now much more important to be an informed mediator of change and, and to work collaboratively with curators and with artists to make decisions that, um, that allow us to sort of deliver the work forward. So that's the mechanism for migration that I'm Can you see to. the Jill Hamilton piece? The yes. Who has first-hand experience of dealing with this? Yes. So, let's give a chance. Yes, El Hamilton. Um, this is a work that uh, was originally made in 1991. Um, it's called Indigo Blue, and it was a site-specific installation in, uh, made in, in Charleston, South Carolina. The artist, Ann Hamilton, is sitting at the table, and um, she's an installation artist and her work often has a performance quality to it. So just to give you an idea of how this work was conceived, and I, I have this urge to um, set it up only slightly and then maybe show the Anne Hamilton video because I think she says it better than, mm -hmm. than I certainly could. But there's 18,000 articles of clothing that are piled up on that, um, on that table. And the work was, in an it was installed in an abandoned warehouse. And um, it had the smell of humidity. Um, and it had these, these work clothes were, were, according to the artist, her riff on the culture of Charleston, South Carolina. And in addition to um, the work clothes, you have Anne Hamilton working with books. And now I do feel, can we show the video? Because I think if Anne um, says it, before we roll, one second, sorry, I'm sorry. Before we roll, the 1991 installation was revisited 16 years later with the artist. And in 2007, the work was acquired into our collection. And as you watch the video, you're gonna see a really important set of transformations in the work. I, I would argue there, there are transformations that you could scratch your head about because the work as it existed in 1991 is not exactly what we acquired in 2007. So with that, maybe we can mm -hmm. speak. Indigo Blue was conceived really in response to an invitation from the curator of the visual arts component of the Spoleto Festival who asked artists to come and 
consider Charleston as a uh, as the site for making work, and to make not necessarily site specific work, but site responsive work to whatever issues, uh, questions um, were raised by being there. As part of my research, I became very fixated on the early economic history in the area and the fact that indigo was the first cash crop that was cultivated in Charleston. What happened is that as I researched this labor history and as I was researching the history of the color blue and its use as it went from being a very high and unique wallpaper to work clothing over time, so what I did was decide that I would be very interested in using that blue clothing that comes from actual labor. So how is it that materials can actually evoke the presence of something that's not stated? Most of the work that I have done on this scale is very temporary. And so things are kind of lifted from a material economy and they return. And so when Madeline and I started this conversation a while back, it's, for me, really exciting because it's the first time to revisit a project that was made very specifically in response to a lot of conditions that were the given of the original site in the Spoleto Festival in an old garage off of the main street in Charleston. How can something that had a, a particular kind of life in a particular context come forward and actually sit with and in a collection? What happens is when you revisit a piece, you're trying to distill from it those things that are the center of the relationships, but not trying to get involved in recreating an atmosphere that can't be remade. What I realized when we were remaking Indigo Blue and entering the questions of that piece and how it comes forward in time and sits with other work and has a duration that it didn't initially have, I realized that my first voice is um, this hand. And it's the hand extending to touch material. And it's the reciprocal act of that first primary extension that when you um, extend your hand, you're always you touch and you're always touched in return. I think everyone in this museum has touched this piece. Work happens because permission is made for it to happen and both individuals and the museum at large has made this space of permission and possibility for something to happen that wouldn't happen otherwise. Can you imagine the responsibility to have a control of this piece and to restore it, and what does it mean to restore it, and to keep it in your uh, storage facilities and to recreate it for the next exhibition? I think that this panel probably gave you sense that the job of contemporary curator, curator of contemporary modern art, and definitely conservator, is so much more complex than any of the predecessors ever experienced in any traditional classical museums. And I have to, uh, to upset you to tell you that it's not going to get easier for you. It's only going to get more and more complicated. And I want to finish up, and after that, we will have a few minutes for questions. Uh, something that I mentioned in my art talk program uh, yesterday and Tuesday on KCRW saying, and I didn't want just to titillate people, but one of the well-known and very respected artists from the 1950s, Piero Manzoni, Manzoni uh, Italian artist who uh, even belongs to generation before Arte Povera. And his famous work consisting of 19 small camps labeled as an artista, artista medra, I guess it's Italian. Yes, Mad okay. It's his thesis in 90 cans. Last and only time I've seen it at MoMA at a wonderful exhibition after Pobra. And I look at that and I was not aware of the existence of this artist and I was kind of, yes, scratching my head. 
I'm intrigued by the piece as a gesture of this piece. But if you are, as a curator or as a restorer, responsible for maintenance of this piece, <laughs> and that metal container start to leak, God forbid, what are your options? And if you decide to empty and to substitute for something else, Sturgeon glue. what do you substitute? <laughs> a lack of conservator of modern museum, <laughs> full of interesting moments. <laughs> I hope you, ladies and gentlemen, are writing notes and planning to write interesting books. But at this point, should we allow you to, ask, uh, to ask a wonderful chance to ask questions?